Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. My guest today is Amy Brady. Amy is the Chief Information Officer of KeyBank, a major regional bank based in Cleveland, Ohio, that earns in excess of $7 billion in annual revenue. Amy's been in her role for more than a decade, and her purview has grown into a remarkable combination of areas such as shared services for technology, operations, data, servicing, cyber and physical security, and procurement. She's also on the boards of a variety of institutions, including DuPont and the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. Hers has been a remarkable career to date with plenty of runway ahead, and I look forward to learning more about all of the above. Amy, welcome to Technovation. It's great to speak with you today. It is great to be here, Peter. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Well, um, Amy, I wanted to begin with a, a description of your business. You are the Chief Information Officer of KeyBank, have been for more than a decade now. Uh, for those who may be less familiar with KeyBank, talk a bit about the business if you would. Sure, sure. And that decade makes me sound really old, Peter. I'm not sure. I like it. <laughs> but um, KeyBank is one of the top 20, top 15 uh, financial institutions in the United States. We are a regional institution. So we focus on 100% in the United States and that we are not global. Um, but the way I like to describe us, however, is that we provide all of the products and services that the trillionaire banks do. So we have everything to offer from debit card to derivatives for our clients. So we serve a uh, consumer client base across the United States um, in uh, 15 states, roughly. And then we um, also have small business, middle market, and our corporate investment bank. So we serve a range of clients uh, through, throughout the country. Um, we are 100% focused on really our purpose, which is helping our clients and our communities thrive. And we really take that purpose to heart by delivering solutions for each of those client segments that meet them along their journey and meet them where they they are and where they want to go um, by, by providing products, but also how they want to interact with the financial institution and with Key. And that clearly has evolved over the past decade. So um, so, so we'll, we'll stop there, but uh, we, we are definitely a, a thriving institution and one that is focused on growth with building relationships of our clients. And tell me, um, it's a great overview. And, and speaking of the trillion dollar banks, you worked for one prior to this at Bank of America. You were the chief information officer of enterprise functions, technology and operations there. Um, and I, I wonder what appealed to you. I, I, everything you just described certainly sounds appealing. Um, but but I'm curious, uh, you talked about the advantages of the trillion dollar banks, but with a regional focus. And you talked about that very compelling purpose. Were it those sort, was it those sorts of things that uh, appeal to you in in uh, you know, moving from a, a global to a regional bank? Yeah, I, I absolutely. I think number one was the purpose and is the purpose. And that has remained our focus for the decade I've been here. And we truly bring that to life when we say we want our clients and communities to thrive. Um, and you do that also, by the way, by helping your employees thrive. So all of that, uh, number one, was, was really, really important. Number two, I think um, coming to a regional institution of our size allows you an intimacy with your client that sometimes you can't always deliver uh, when you are at a tr uh, one of the larger institutions. And, and that was appealing. And then personally and professionally for me, it allowed me to take my 25 years of experience in a variety of roles across financial services um, I spent the first part of my career in the front end, actually running markets, then moved to innovation and then moved into tech and ops. And so it allowed me to take all of that and kind of in this role, running technology, running shared service operations, um, running our contact centers, uh, really help enable the business at key. Um, and so, you know, when you're at the bigger institutions, you, you have um, large budget budgets and large teams, and you have to go very deep. Um, here, I've been able to go a little bit broader, and you can bring those pieces together. And it's exciting to um, really make a difference. Yeah, fascinating. You talked a bit about your purview here, uh, technology, operations, services organization, um, op uh, data, uh, cyber, physical security, procurement. It's, it's quite a broad purview as a chief information officer. I, I wonder, did it begin with this breadth? Was it something that broadened over the decade plus that you've been with the organization? Talk about your current purview and how it's expanded, if you would. Yeah, it certainly has changed. Um, when Beth Mooney, the prior CEO, recruited me to come to Key, there was always intention of having technology and operations come together um, because we talked about um, 
as you digitize your enterprise, that alignment of of having technology and all those back office processes together, um, we, we talked about the benefits. So my role when I first joined was technology, but within about two years, year and a half, we added all of the back office um, uh, operations. And then in the past uh, two or three years, we added contact center and a few other things. And, and again, we, we've been very deliberate about talking, bringing together um, capabilities where you could see the value of the technology and the automation and the tools that are available to us today, truly digitizing from the client experience all the way through to the back end. Um, I've often said that, you know, back office operations only exist in a bank because we haven't figured out how to automate it yet. I like that. I like that framing. That's very interesting. I wanted to also ask you, you talked about the purpose of helping uh, clients and communities thrive and, and in the, as a byproduct of that, or um, in so doing also helping employees thrive as many of them are customers of the bank, no doubt as well. And in addition to the, the job that they have, um, I know that another goal is building enduring client relationships through innovative solutions and end-to-end -end digital experience. And this gets into a, a bit of what you described, even at the outset of the, when Beth Mooney, the prior CEO, hired you digitizing the enterprise and thinking further about end-to-end -end digital experience. Talk a bit about that in its current iteration, how you think about end-to-end -end digital experience, if you would. Yeah, I, I think it's really important. I think that if you think about a decade ago, there was no doubt financial institutions and other industries were very focused on the consumer experience, right? It was clearly moving from your desktop to mobile um, and, and really getting that interaction easier and frictionless for the consumer. So that evolution started a long time ago. Um, under Chris Gorman, our current CEO's leadership, he really took that to the next level and said, okay, we have to accelerate that digitization work. And he really made it a, a top-down strategic priority, which has also been terrific. At the same time, the pandemic happened. Right, and if if nothing else came out of the pandemic, um, clearly the use of digital properties skyrocketed, and it, it, the consumer again was well on that journey, but the middle market and business banking clients and even corporate clients, there was some adoption, but when everybody got shut down, all of a sudden, there was a different interaction model, and so I think a lot of us in financial services found that we had not invested enough in those self-service capabilities for that client segment base. And so we're taking the consumer learning into those spaces. Um, and that's where the real investment now has gone even further. When I think about end-to-end, -end, you can put a really pretty front end on an app, right? We all know what our favorite app is on our phone. And, and we can all do that and make it look pretty. But the real, to me, the real secret sauce is how do you pull that through all of your processes? And then how do you make it even easier for your relationship managers or your bankers to use the technology so they have a digital experience and can meet the client where the client is as well? And, and all of that needs to be powered by incredible analytics and insights, because if not, it's just pretty, not smart. And these processes have to be smart. Um, so I think we're really learning and growing um, as the tools grow, as our clients' demands grow, um, but and then getting very targeted on what do we want to deliver for each segment, because when it comes down to it, the client really only cares about what you're doing for them. Very interesting insights, Amy, and, and it really underscores the, the fact that um, you, you need to bear in mind the needs of the operation and the processes that you have internally to bring that to life. Also, the needs of different kinds of customers, as you point out, uh, B2C uh, uh, banking uh, uh, transactions, B2B, et cetera, and different kinds of consumer needs and so, and so forth. Um, talk a bit about the collaborative aspect of what you and your team do. Um, this, this is not done in a vacuum, naturally. It's not like you're divining all of this. Uh, without that collaboration, no doubt that's essential, being a partner to uh, everyone across the organization and ultimately the customers of the organization as well. Can you talk a bit about that, that method uh, or the methods rather that you use in order to elicit those insights? Yeah, I mean, I, no doubt that you've always, we, we've been talking for years that technology had to have a seat at the table, right? Um, and I think that that dialogue is almost passe at this point. It's it, it's kind of like, well, what do you mean? Why wouldn't they? Why aren't the technologists, why aren't the engineers um, at the table? And, and quite frankly, 
our engineers need to understand the business. They need to understand what our clients want and they need to understand the business strategy. Um, so all of that has to come together. And so whether you're working in an agile um, structure uh, or framework, uh, which we happen to be adopting and doing more and more of at Key, those cross-functional teams coming together to create um, those really value-added journeys for the client um, it's really where the secret sauce is, right? Because you have to bring all of that together. You have to bring the engineering capability, um, the client insight, the analytics, the marketing, the product, all of that has to be there together and it has to be real time. Um, I think in my 30 plus years doing financial services, in financial services, uh, I've never seen a time where change uh, and the pace of change has been faster. And there's lots of reasons for that, but one of the top reasons is our clients are demanding more and they're demanding frictionless experiences. They want value from their interaction in the bank. And so how do you deliver that? You have to have all those cross-disciplinary functions coming together to collaborate. Really interesting. I, I love the insight that engineers need to understand the business and the nature of these cross-functional teams that are brought together as well. And I'd love to maybe double click on that a little bit further in terms of the team that you lead and the skills you recruit for in order to bring to life what you've described. No doubt it's very different, or I shouldn't say probably not entirely different, uh, but, but uh, so, some significant differences now relative to the beginning of your tenure at Key to say nothing, of course, of your the beginning of your time in financial services. It's no, no longer can you just be a great technologist. One has to have a much better understanding of the context in which you are playing as well. Can you talk about the evolution of that a bit, if you would? Sure. I, I, I think you're spot on. I mean, we I've always said we don't deliver technology for technology's sake. We deliver technology to enable the business strategy, to enable key to grow, to be profitable, um, to deliver our operating leverage, to enable our clients to have an experience that is um, what they expect and what will delight them ultimately to use more self-service to make it easier. Um, so it is not technology for technology's sake. I think the biggest change has also been the uh, interactions of the different types of technologies that we're using to deliver those solutions. You know, it used to be you could put in a platform or a application or whatever you might call it, and it could be out there for 30 years or 10 years even, and it would run and that would be great. But now you're updating and delivering change to experiences daily, sometimes hourly. Um, you are putting in platforms and taking out platforms because they are out of date very quickly. Um, so you need engineers who are thinking much differently about how do you engineer all those pieces and parts together to work. And again, you're powering all this with a data and analytics and insight that Quite frankly, financial services had been terrific at mining for credit risk and liquidity risk, but maybe not so much around the client and the client interaction. And so we're getting much better at that. So I think those are skills that are very different in how you bring th those teams together. The other thing I would say from an engineering perspective is you're seeing some decline in certain types of technologies and new emerging technologies. So you have, uh, I feel, we have a real responsibility to help our teammates who want to reskill and learn those new technologies um, to have the opportunity to move from, let's say, mainframe-based COBOL uh, programming to no-code, low-code, or RPA, or new cloud technologies that we're using, or how do you bring uh, custom code together with package software as a service, you know, all of the integration that has to happen. That's a different type of engineering than maybe was occurring 20 years ago. Great insights. A couple different things I'd love to I'd love to explore a little bit further. You, you mentioned analytics and insights here again. Earlier you'd mentioned how uh, what you're doing needs to be smart, not just pretty. Um, and, you know, as you point out, uh, financial institutions have been awash in data historically. Uh, but finding new ways to mine that for um, analytics and insights, ultimately insights that will, will, will make, uh, make the business smarter and better at what it does. Uh, easier said than done. Having a, 
a coherent strategy to bring that to life is really necessary. Um, and I wonder how you thought about the evolution of that in the grand scheme of things. Also, as you point out, relatively new discipline for the IT organization in financial institutions. This has existed in other areas, and maybe that makes it a little bit easier in as much as there, there are parallels or lessons one can draw from other parts of the organization that have been mining uh, data stacks in various ways for insights as well. But talk about a, a bit about the, the creation and evolution of your data strategy, if you would. Well, you know, it's um, it's evolved as as has has everything. Um, but but I think that at the core, it's again goes back to those cross disciplinary teams coming together to say, how do we deliver insights that our clients will value? Because it's their money, it's their transactions, um, and it's important to them. And so, how do we deliver it in a way at the intersection, at the time of the transaction that matters as well? And so. Again, we might have been terrific at analyzing things from a past predicting the future, but when you're talking about real-time delivery of insights, that takes different technology. It takes different powering of analytics, which is why, quite frankly, we've partnered with Google to move a lot of our data to the cloud so we can use some of those native um, tools that they have to do powerful analytics and deliver real-time. Um, and then, you know, so that's for the client, but you also think about the employee. You think about how do you deliver insights to a banker who can then sit down with their client face-to-face -face and have some really good insights to deliver to their client. Or when they log on to their computer every morning, they have um, some insights on what they should prioritize that day based on what their client activity was the night before. That's real value add, right? And it also delivers efficiency uh, and productivity to, to the enterprise. The other, the other piece that I, I think that I, I don't wanna forget because I think it's more important is as clients become more digitally savvy and are using self-service, we we're investing a lot on how do we finally create and deliver that omni-channel experience from digital to contact center. Because if you're on your mobile app or you're on your computer, you're not gonna, when you have a question, you're not gonna get in your car and drive to a branch. You want to be able to very quickly talk to someone, and that someone may be an intelligent agent, meaning an automated agent, uh, who can answer your question, or ultimately may be a live agent who can answer that question. Either way, you as a client don't want to have to re-authenticate, re-explain what you're working on, you know, all those things that frustrate all of us. And so that's another place where process engineering, technology, analytics is really driving a better experience for our clients and a more efficient process for the institution. Uh, very interesting indeed. I also want to, you, you highlighted how um, you, you are immersed, your team is immersed in modern technologies. You talked about low code, no code, RPA, cloud technologies, just to name a few, uh, as well as helping uh, members of your team move perhaps from older technologies to uh, become trained and facile in these new technologies as well. I wanted to ask actually, what's the what processes do you and your team use in order to keep yourself current on new technologies? And you know, do you have a bit of a playground in which you can experiment or members of your team can do so to understand the potential application of new technologies uh, to the business or not as the case may be? What, what's, what's the method you use, please? Yep. We, um, we actually, I'm very proud of the team. About a little over five years ago now, we launched a program uh, within my organization called Future Ready. And it, it coincided when we launched our, uh, it was about five years ago that we launched our first uh, robotic process automation COE, Center of Excellence, which really wasn't a COE. It was really just practicing with different technologies, right? But we knew there was something coming there around how do you use all these automation technologies to improve the back office processes? So as we, as we were looking at this, we said, okay, wait, we have to invest time, talent, and tools for our teammates who choose to invest in their careers um, to become future ready. Whether you were an operations analyst in, the, in a process that was going to change, or whether you were a technologist sitting in an area that we knew we were going to need less of in the future. And so we launched this future ready program. We, we um, evolved over time where our teammates can do a self-assessment. They can talk about skills they want to learn, and it'll give you a roadmap. And then we give each teammate 10 hours a quarter where they can invest. And we've got lots of different 
types of training because everybody learns differently um, where they can invest in themselves so that they can be future ready for the job that they may want. And it's really empowered our teammates to um, think about, and we've been very transparent about certain technologies that we are going to sunset. And we've also been equally as transparent about certain technologies that we see coming on board um, that we need more of. And, um, and, and then we've also done it same with our operations teammates because their roles are changing. They need to become more tech savvy on how to work through processes who have that have more automation. And so how do we train them to be able to use the tools better um, and uh, as their roles evolve? And then the, the last piece, uh, a couple of years ago, we decided we, we launched a program called Tech Ready. And that was very focused on um, taking our teammates who were sitting in operations roles, whether it was contact center or lockbox or you know, payment processing, and who had a technical aptitude who wanted to learn how to become engineers. And so we have launched this program where we put cohorts of 15 people roughly at a time and they go through a boot camp and they come out and are placed into entry level engineer roles it could be ro uh, process uh, robotic process engineers it could be coding for a certain platform that we are uh, growing um, and we've had great success there we've had um to date, about 50% of the people that go through that program are people of color and over 50% are female. And they're all, I mean, it's life-changing because they're going from, you know, entry-level hourly jobs to entry-level salary jobs in tech. And there's quite a differential in that. So um, that's helped us a lot, especially through this, what was uh, a, a war for some tech talent there for a while. I think we have a responsibility as CIOs to build the workforce of the future, um, not just not just sit there and stand and say we don't have enough technical talent. You're also very passionate about uh, the community that you're a part of. Uh, you've lived in Cleveland now for a while, where KeyBank is uh, is headquartered. You're on the uh, boards or committees relative to the arts, the board of uh, Playhouse Square, um, which you, you once mentioned to me is the largest performing arts center in the U.S. outside of New York. Uh, mm -hmm. you're, you, you're affiliated with uh, local universities like uh, Case Western Reserve and, and, and other organizations, in addition to living and being part of the community there. I know from past conversations we've had, you're, you're a, a big proponent of Northeastern Ohio and Cleveland more specifically. Talk a bit about that as a business community and a tech center. Yeah, I mean, we've got uh, people underestimate uh, Cleveland and, and, and the Midwest, I would say, yeah. uh, in general, as I did before I moved here. Um, there is an incredible amount of technical talent here. And you think about the diversity of industries that are in the Midwest from manufacturing to uh, medical, I mean, just huge medical uh, community to insurance and financial services. Um, and all of those, the, the CIO network here, we have been very, um, very focused on how do we build the technical talent to support the growing community. Um, and, and there's a lot of similarities of the skills that are needed across these various industries. Um, and so, so that has been a focus of ours is to make sure that we are reskilling in our communities as well to help people have a future. And then working with the whether it be the local community college here that has been in existence for well over a hundred years or the state uh, institution here or the higher ed, like a Case Western Reserve University that's producing you know, higher level masters and PhDs in certain um, um, fields. So you've got the spectrum because quite frankly, not every tech job needs to have a four-year degree. Um, and some do require that more advanced training. So. Um, we're, we're all working together to build a stronger community because I don't think there's an industry out there that isn't being transformed by technology in some some way. I, I, speaking of board affiliations, you're on the board of directors of DuPont, uh, also the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, another uh, local, though with global implications, uh, uh, organization. Uh, I wanted to ask you a bit about your pathway to board membership, especially in one case, a publicly traded organization and another uh, major government institution. Um, how did you uh, how did you originally get involved? And um, th this is a relatively uh, relatively elite club that you're a part of the one that's uh, 
um, bringing in more members, that is technologists who are boards uh, on the boards of uh, major institutions such as these. And I wonder what the pathway was for you and if it was something that was a long ambition of yours or something that kind of fell in your lap as the case may be. Yeah, um, I, but probably a little both. <laughs> um, um, I would love to tell you that I had this perfect, perfect plan. Uh, that's not true. Um, I, I do think it was an ambition of mine, one, because uh, I would say the the um, both boards, the Federal Reserve Board and the DuPont Board were ambitions of mine uh, from a from two different perspectives. As a longtime banker, to serve on the Federal Reserve Board is quite a privilege. And it is, um, you get to see uh, what's happening across financial services from a totally different perspective. Um, And I think it has been extremely valuable for me to understand, especially over the past three years, um, what, what's been going on in our economy, right? And, and to be able to see that firsthand and witness what the Fed is trying to do to help our economy, um, it's, it's been quite eye-opening. Um, and, and I think as a banker and the, the Fed structures, there are three tiers of bankers that are represented on the, um, the boards at all time. And I, I think them having someone with business and tech and cyber experience um, it has been extremely helpful. Um, on a public board perspective, um, I think I think look as you know there are, there are a growing number of women serving on public company boards, although it is not yet where it needs to be. Um, so I was privileged to go through a, a, a program that happened to be sponsored by Deloitte, um, but there are others that that really focus on getting women who are in C-suite level jobs prepared for board membership. What does it take? What does it mean to be a part of that? And what are the responsibilities? And then from there began my kind of search with the support of our board of directors and our CEO. Serving on a board that is a totally different industry, again, is incredibly valuable to bring back to your own job. And I, I believe that we, I bring insights into that uh, industry as well through my technology experience, through my M&A experience, through uh, cyber experience, which unfortunately none of us are immune to. Um, and so there's real value both ways. Yeah. Can I ask you, as you were going through the training uh, to become board ready, what were some of the skills that were particularly critical uh, that you acquired through that process? Or or maybe put a different way uh, for fellow chief information officers who might wish to walk in your footsteps. What were some of the things, uh, you know, the the, the newer skill sets you needed to develop that perhaps you weren't weren't, uh, part of your everyday um, work in order to be board ready? Yeah, I think I think the the big uh, shift is really that recognition of the role of the board is is governance and oversight, not management. And so um, I've been very fortunate to be, uh, you know, presenting to our board for the 10 years I've been here. And so I'm very involved in board and board committees and um, and helping to be board liaison to one of the committees, et cetera. So I get to see it firsthand, but when you switch roles and all of a sudden you're asking the questions you know, how are you asking questions that are around governance and oversight that are not going so deep that you're trying to micromanage because that's our day job uh, and not our board oversight job? But how are you being thoughtful about positioning those uh, your, your work there to bring your expertise into that different industry, but also um, to probe to make sure that you're doing your you're you're doing your fiduciary responsibility as a as a uh, board member. I wanted to also ask you, uh, Amy, we've talked about a number of trends, trends related to a customer experience. We've talked about a number of technology trends. As you look to the future, uh, I wonder if there are any additional trends that excite you that uh, that you and the team are are focused on that you might, might be willing to underscore. You know, there's a couple that scare me. <laughs> <laughs> like quantum scares me um, uh, in the sense of... Uh, I haven't figured out the, I'm sure there's great use for quantum, but I also see all the nefarious potential uses for quantum. And, and uh, so that makes from a cyber perspective, I get, I get nervous about that. Um, but, but I'm sure there'll be fabulous uses about, uh, of, of that technology as well. You know, I, I don't know that we see one technology right now that we're really excited about. What I do see is the combination of technologies that is exciting. And, um, and, and it's complicated, right? Because 
you are no longer managing an ecosystem that is, now I don't think banks have had this forever, but that is 100% yours, right? We've got um, so many different providers that are serving us on top of the things that we're creating ourselves. And all of that has to work every day. And all of it has to deliver for our various constituencies. And then how do you, on top of that, constantly be leveraging the technologies in, in automation? And I would say AI broadly, um, how do we use that in a way to make our processes smarter, faster, leaner, and better experience? But they don't do that by themselves, right? It, they do it with other technologies. So I think it's a it's a combination of things and how you bring those things together in an efficient and effective way. Um, so I guess the long way of saying what I get excited about is the problem solving. Um, uh, th there's a lot to do in these roles um, and there's a lot to create and there's a lot to protect. Um, the, you know, the, the cyber and fraud challenges that we all have uh, and the velocity of that, um, it's that's very intense. And so you have to have a team hyper-focused on making sure everything you're building, everything you're operating is also secure. It's easy to use, but it's secure. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunity for really good engineering. Yeah, great, great response. I really uh, love the, the the idea of the number of technologies that are coming together to do really remarkable things. And it's fascinating to hear more about how your team is doing just that. I wanted to ask you at the close, uh, Amy, yours has been such a remarkable uh, career, uh, one as a chief information officer in title, but with a purview that is really expansive as we covered at the outset. Um, also one that includes board membership at some of the largest institutions uh, in the world as well. Uh, you, you, I wonder, as you reflect upon your career, what have been some of the difference makers for you? Um, and and I, I, I ask this perhaps uh, not, not only for, for what might be an interesting story, but also the extent to which there might be somebody listening who would wish to uh, have, a, have a career that rhymes with yours. Uh, what, what, what are some things that have been uh, the difference makers along the way? Well, I'd start by saying thank you that you think I've achieved. I'm still wondering what I'm going to do when I grow up. So um, <laughs> I, I, I think that um, maybe that's part of the success is never feeling that you've achieved success. And so you're constantly a little bit motivated about what's what's next around the corner. Um, but but I think I would I would sum it up in a couple of things. I, you know, never be afraid to take opportunities that are are outside your comfort zone. Um, if you had asked me. 20 years ago, if I was going to be a CIO, I would have told you, I don't even know what a CIO is. And so, um, you know, that my career took lots of different uh, turns. And I feel very fortunate to have been on the, quote, business side, the front end of the client, all the way to the back end of the business and, and to be able to see that. So I think being open to opportunities is really important. Um, I tell young folks today, never stop learning. Um, and, and that is true now more than ever. I was never 100% prepared for any role I took, including the role I have today. I don't feel like I'm 100% prepared for it today because what made you successful five years ago is not going to make you successful five years from now. There's too much, there's too much velocity of, of, of change. Um, I think being, being a change agent and being change ready are critical for success. So how do you lead people through change? How do you personally adapt to change? And how do you create change? I think I've been um, probably a hallmark of kind of my career. And then most important to all of it is building teams and surrounding yourself with people who are different from you, who don't think like you, act like you, look like you, don't have the same experiences as you, and bringing them together to create. Um, and by doing that, by the way, you have to accept that they're probably smarter than you too. Uh, I can tell you that every person who works for me right now is better at their job than I could ever be. And that makes me better. And I hope in turn, I make them better. So building diverse teams, um, I believe is critical to success. Well, that's a great thoughts all around, Amy. I appreciate you you offering some of those reflections and appreciate uh, ultimately a, a great conversation across the board, re really emblematic of the remarkable career that you have led, uh, the innovation you're driving at KeyBank. Uh, it, it's been a great conversation. Thank you so much for taking time with me today. Thank you, Peter. <laughs>